Since the dawn of commercial aviation, we've seen thunderstorms cause delays, aircraft diverting, and accidents. And airlines attempted to find ways to avoid en route weather while still maintaining their scheduled operations. So today, we're gonna to take a look at the history of airborne weather radar through this latest video. Now back in 1949, American Airlines and the United States Navy combined together to conduct tests of an airborne weather radar system in a Convair airliner. And that was reported in October of 1949 in Aviation Week magazine. And this remained in an experimental state for the next few years until in 1955, Aviation Week reported that American Airlines was ready to equip its DC-7 aircraft with airborne weather radar. And many, many other airlines quickly embraced this new technology. In fact, Aviation Week reported the, about the airborne radar boom and demonstrated various aircraft and how they could be modified to add weather radar and even kept an airborne weather radar scorecard. This same article quoted a Northwest Airlines pilot on the new technology saying, we all wonder how we ever got along without it. Pretty soon the public won't fly in anything but radar equipped airplanes. And here's another example of a United DC-7 as all the airlines scrambled to add this new technology to their, to their fleets. And radar was life-changing for crews who were formerly navigating through areas of embedded thunderstorms by guesswork and basically just praying for safety and avoiding significant routing changes. But trying to get through those thunderstorms was really difficult without radar. And the new technology quickly became trusted by flight crews and by aircraft dispatchers. And MacArthur Job, in an excellent book called Air Disaster, states, since the advent of airborne weather radar, more and more aircraft began to be mar dispatched in marginal weather with the captain having primary responsibility for avoiding severe conditions. And he, said that too much reliance was probably being placed on an instrument which could not actually see the turbulence. And this was the beginning of an era where there were multiple weather-related accidents, where dispatchers and flight crews placed too much trust in the weather radar to help them avoid areas of bad weather, thinking that weather radar was going to help them avoid turbulence as well as precipitation. So unfortunately, there were several accidents and I wanna look in detail at one of these specific accidents, which was Braniff International Flight 250. And dispatchers in this accident were aware that other flights had diverted or delayed, uh, but the dispatcher didn't inform the accident flight crew of what was going on. Now this happened in August 6, 1966, and it was a BAC-111, departed Kansas City, bound for Omaha, Nebraska. And prior to departing Kansas City, the crew discussed expected en route weather with another Braniff flight crew that had just arrived from Chicago. That incoming Braniff crew described a solid line of very intense thunderstorms with continuous lightning and no apparent breaks. And the dispatchers didn't inform the crew of other crew's decisions to avoid the weather and the dispatcher involved in this accident testified to the NTSB that if he received a severe weather warning for an area through which company aircraft were operating, it was doubtful he would forward that information to en route aircraft. In his opinion, the crews in the area would be better able to evaluate the weather than he. So without being informed by the dispatcher, of this very severe area of weather, Flight 250 continued ahead toward the line of thunderstorms. It did request with ATC a deviation to the left to avoid the weather, but it suddenly encountered a severe gust of wind in the turbulent shear zone near the line of thunderstorms. And here is an excellent graphic from that same book I referenced earlier, Air Disaster by MacArthur Job. As the aircraft flew through this roll area of turbulence coming out of the front of this thunderstorm, the gust hit 
the elevator and broke the elevator and the rudder off of the tail. And so as it's clubbed sideways, basically smashed upward, the tailplane completely fails. And when the tailplane of the aircraft failed, the aircraft entered a violent pitch down movement. And as it descended, the starboard wing also failed, which released fuel and the wing tank exploded. Witnesses who were outside watching this approaching storm, they saw the aircraft plummet to the ground and everyone on board was killed. The NTSB determined the probable cause was in-flight structural failure caused by extreme turbulence during operations of the aircraft in an area of avoidable hazardous weather. And that word avoidable is really key. It basically said that the dispatcher possessed weather knowledge but didn't provide it to the crew of Flight 250. And as a result, 42 people were killed. So, so what can we learn from all this, the history of airborne weather radar, just briefly? Some mornings, uh, specific training is required to operate these pieces of equipment. If you have one on a small general aviation aircraft, it's quite limited. And even worse, you can get what's called attenuation where if you get rain or ice on your radome or the radome gets um, damaged in some way, that causes even more issues. And let's talk about attenuation briefly. Attenuation is a shadowing effect. So if we think of radar as a robot, all it can do is give us information back. And I like to think of it as a dumb robot shining a light down a dark alley and all it can tell us is what it sees with that light. So if we look at this area, that radar is gonna send out a beam of energy and it's gonna reflect what it got back. And it doesn't see a lot of energy in this area up here and so you might interpret that as a clear area. However, you might be wrong about that. That could be just blocked. If the energy cannot get through this area of the thunderstorm, then this area may not actually be clear. Again, the dumb radar robot just gives us energy back. That's all it can do for us. So a rule from the great radar uh, Gentleman Archie Trammell is never ever continue toward a radar shadow. Failure to recognize a shadow and abide by the rule is a cause of 90% of convective weather accidents. So let's take a quick look at one of those. Southern Airways Flight 242. And this was a DC-9 that was operated and I've got kind of an overview of the, the map. The crew was going back and forth had a long day flying through the area, flew through the area less than two hours before, so they thought they knew what the weather was doing from earlier in the day. And this map kind of shows what the crew was doing on that day. They were going to Atlanta, they went over to Huntsville, Muscle Shoals, back to Huntsville, and flying back through this area is where the accident occurred. Now, what happened with that accident as the crew departed Huntsville and they were approaching an area of severe storms. The cockpit voice recorder recording showed the crew was trying to go to a clear area that they saw to the left. And when they tried to go to the left, they actually flew into one of these radar shadows. Again, that radar energy couldn't get through the precipitation. It was so intense. So it looked like a clear area. However, it was not. And the entire aircraft was destroyed 63 people on the airplane were killed and nine people on the ground. And that looked like a clear area to them, but it was not. So I want to close with just a uh, statement that while the history of airborne weather radar is really amazing, the fact that they have been able to put these in small packages that we can carry on airplanes is great for aviation safety, but we always have to remember Radar is history. Radar only shows us what happened in the past, and it only shows us what it can see. So keep that in mind as you fly. Fly safely, know the limits of your equipment, and remember, radar is history.
Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Tell your friends about Airlines 101. And I hope to be producing some more videos in the coming months. See you guys soon.